As someone who's been in the business for a long time, this is just unbelievable. It's, you know, I say science is the hero here. In March of 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And in the 19 months since, the world has changed. Social distancing shutdowns. Bars and other non-essential businesses in San Antonio will have to shut down. This video shows thousands of families in their cars lining up to receive food. But through it all, science has provided hope. From a research perspective, all targeting and all focus went to COVID research, and rightfully so. In the form of treatments and eventually vaccines. It was incredibly fast, uh, which was necessary, uh, given the challenges that we had, um, and not normal. And some of that groundbreaking research done right here in San Antonio. We helped in testing of vaccines that have been given to a billion people worldwide in monkeys last year, and we helped in testing of therapeutics that doctors are now giving to people. I'm proud as a San Antonio that we have Texas Biomed here that does such uh, groundbreaking research that's impacting lives all over the world. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're introducing you to some of the San Antonio scientists who were behind crucial COVID-19 research from the beginning of this pandemic. They walk us through how COVID has affected their work, the incredible scientific breakthroughs we've witnessed, and how those breakthroughs could help us with future viruses and diseases. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. Demand in depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscasts throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. This week, the team is spotlighting some of the groundbreaking work that local scientists do at Texas Biomedical Institute. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. Since early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered nearly every aspect of our lives. The shutdowns, the job losses, the millions of deaths globally. It's difficult to put into words just how much has been forever changed and how much so many have lost. We've covered so many of these stories on KSAT 12 as well as right here on this show and we'll continue to do so. But for this episode, we want to focus on something incredible that has come out of this pandemic. The scientific research that's offered us hope through it all. And did you know that a big part of that research has happened right here in our own backyard at Texas Biomedical Research Institute? Scientists there told us that as the rest of the world slowed down, their work was speeding up. It was fascinating in a way and also you know, really worrying. That's how Dr. Joanne Turner describes watching news about the novel coronavirus play out in real time in early 2020. As Texas Biomed's vice president of research and a scientist with an active research program in tuberculosis, Turner knows a lot about infectious disease. Anyone that works on infectious diseases knows that there is likely to be a global pandemic. But still, just like so many of us, she didn't realize how serious a threat COVID-19 would become. And then it became apparent that it was uh, going to be massive uh, and have a major impact on research, on people's daily lives, on the economy. Uh, we were really heading in something very, very worrying. Very soon after the um the, uh, the start of the pandemic, it, it became clear that this virus was much different than the other SARS coronavirus that had emerged uh, back in 2003. Researchers at Texas Biomed were forced to switch gears. From a research perspective, all all targeting and all focus went to COVID research, and rightfully so. And as cities across the world were shutting down, there was a growing sense of urgency felt across the scientific world. We were actually one of the few places prepared for the pandemic. Dr. Larry Schlesinger, president and CEO of Texas Biomed, says the institute was prepared, thanks in part to a strategic plan that was adopted in 2018. Part of that plan included reconstructing Texas Biomed to work on infectious disease prevention. When we knew there was a problem, 
uh, you know, January, February of 2020. We immediately, without any silos or walls, put the right scientists in the room throughout the institute, came in a room and said, we need, to, we need to come in, we need to lean in and make a difference here based on our expertise and our resources. The expertise here in biomedical research dates back 80 years. The private not-for-profit institute has had a hand in working on medical research for decades, including the first Ebola treatment and the first treatment for hepatitis C. We have the ability to handle uh, research and development related to any infectious diseases because we have tremendous history and experience related to what is called biocontainment research. Biocontainment research is done in biosafety labs, labs that are designed to allow scientists to study contagious viruses without releasing those viruses to the public or infecting researchers. These labs are ranked from biosafety level one through four, depending on the danger of the pathogens being studied at each level. For example, biosafety level one, or BSL-1, is for pathogens that don't really pose a threat. A biocontainment level one is your kitchen. BSL-2 is for human diseases that pose a moderate hazard, like hepatitis viruses. BSL-3 labs are used when dealing with pathogens that may cause serious or potentially lethal disease through inhalation. Biocontainment level 3 facilities are specialized air-controlled environments to conduct research that um, is um, uh, on infectious diseases that can affect humans, but for which there are cures. And then biocontainment level four is the highest level containment where um, we work on infectious agents safely on uh, those agents like Ebola virus that have no current cures and so we have to do things very safely. Then there are BSL-4 labs. Texas Biomed is home to one of 10 operational BSL-4 labs in the entire country and the precautions researchers have to take when doing work in these labs is serious. This video shows one of the Institute's researchers preparing to do work at a BSL-4 lab. She's putting on this air-supplied positive pressure suit to take a look at data related to a study on the Ebola virus. There are safety precautions that researchers must take when entering and exiting. The lab has its own ventilation system and airtight doors, and the data stored there cannot be removed. Another resource Texas Biomed has on its campus, the ability to test on animals. The Institute is home to thousands of animals, more than 2,500 non-human primates and about 5,000 rodents. Schlesinger says it didn't take scientists at the facility long to know they would need to develop animal models for COVID. To do that, they needed money. Schlesinger says thanks to community partners and philanthropic supporters, they raised $5 million within a couple of weeks. This is unprecedented. So um, we had the expertise, we had the, the, the animals, and we had the uh, resources now. From there, research was able to begin. Scientists at Texas Biomedical Research Institute joined in the global search for treatments and a vaccine to take on this pandemic. Brina Monterosa breaks down how that research began and the role that animals played in the process. To find a cure, treatment, or vaccine for a virus, scientists first have to understand how that virus works. What does it do? How does it replicate? What happens when it infects a host? So the very first step was verse is getting the virus. Then we had to amplify, which essentially means growing up the virus in a way that we didn't change what happened to the virus. Dr. Ricardo Carillon Jr. is a professor and director of maximum containment research at Texas Biomed. He was hired on as a scientist after receiving his PhD in 2003. And I've been able to work at Texas Biomed in the biocontainment lab, the BSO4 lab, and develop new programs looking at hemorrhagic fever viruses like Ebola, Lhasa, and um, arena viruses, in addition to now working on COVID at BSL-3. He explained to us that after they grew the virus, characterized and sequenced it, the next step was to develop animal models. That just means they found a protocol in which they could, in a controlled fashion inside of a biocontainment lab, try to infect the animal with the virus. When we first encountered this new virus, we didn't know which animal model we could use. We didn't know whether it would infect non-human primates or rodents or another species. Uh, we had clues. Once they determined rodents and non-human primates could be infected with SARS-CoV-2, they were able to test treatments and vaccines. So Pfizer calls Texas Biomed 
and said, we have a vaccine, this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It's an mRNA vaccine. Um, we've done some work in, in the tissue culture dishes. We need to put it in animals, and you know how to do that. Human trials are really good, but before the human trials, you have to make sure something's safe and effective in, human, uh, in animals. Uh, so that we know it's going to be safe when we put it into humans. And we started conducting research in the primates because we had already discovered that they develop disease like humans. And from that research, we discovered their vaccine was highly protected, uh, uh, highly protected the animals from COVID. The data collected from animal studies was used to help prove that the vaccines were safe enough to be used in human clinical trials. Research and particularly non-human primate research was instrumental in uh, the licensure of the two approved vaccines. That was Dr. Deepak Kashal. The two vaccines he's referring to are the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, the ones created using mRNA technology. You've probably heard mRNA used a lot over the course of the past year, but there's still some confusion about what exactly mRNA is and the role it could play in the future of vaccines. Lexi Salazar explains. You've no doubt heard of DNA. It's the backbone of who we are. But all humans also have something called messenger RNA, or mRNA. mRNA takes DNA code and converts it to proteins, which, in turn, helps combat disease and define our body's immune system. We also know some viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, also make mRNA. Just as we have mRNA to keep our bodies healthy, this virus relies on mRNA to populate and reproduce. In about the early 1990s, people had an idea that mRNA could be a delivery system to allow our bodies to make the protein from the mRNA of foreign invaders, not the whole virus, just the specific protein that our bodies could react to. Think of it this way. mRNA is like a factory. It helps the body make the proteins it needs. In the case of COVID, the mRNA vaccine acts like visiting factory workers, stopping by your body to teach your own factory, your own mRNA, how to make what it needs to protect you against COVID. Specifically, the mRNA vaccines teach our bodies to make the spike protein that covers SARS-CoV-2 so that our immune systems learn to recognize it if ever we do become infected with the coronavirus. The mRNA vaccine from the virus then degrades over time, which is how mRNA works. It's made and then it's degraded. As Dr. Schlesinger mentioned, this technology has been researched for use in vaccines since the 90s. When SARS-CoV-2 emerged, scientists simply pivoted. They used existing research to focus on the pandemic. The mRNA vaccines have been in development for a long time and for other infections. So then they're not new to science. I think they're new to the public. So Pfizer and Moderna were the first vaccines to use this technology, but the hope is that it could be used in the future. Schlesinger said it's already being looked at to hopefully find vaccines for RSV, para-influenza, maybe even HIV. The key to COVID-19 is that that one protein, that spike protein, has been such an effective target to enable us to make these highly effective vaccines. Other viruses, not so easy. It's important to note that the animal models created by Texas Biomed were also used to test Regeneron's antibody cocktail, a treatment now widely used in COVID-19 patients. Most notably, the treatment was used on former President Donald Trump when he contracted the virus last year. And research continues in their labs on potential variants and the next generation of vaccines as this pandemic continues. The goal for all of us since March of 2020 has been to get through this pandemic, but the end of headlines dominated by COVID-19 does not mean we're necessarily done with pandemics. In fact, every scientist we talked to for this episode is already thinking about the next one. They're predicting that infectious diseases will play a much bigger role in our lives than we've ever really dealt with in the past. And what they've learned from COVID-19 could change things. The key is we may not be so fortunate next time. Next time we may have an outbreak of a fever and we don't know what it is. Fortunate might seem an odd word to use when it comes to COVID, but according to researchers, that's exactly what we are. Fortunate they already had some familiarity with coronaviruses. Fortunate the mRNA technology existed and money was made available to develop a vaccine that works. 
I think this is a really effective and relatively easy to manufacture safe platform for vaccines for the future. So I think it's a game changer. And changes will certainly have to be made, he says. How the next vaccine is formulated to fight the next virus that's discovered is an unknown. Schlesinger says every year about 15 to 20 new viruses are uncovered worldwide. While COVID-19 is no longer new, we are still learning about it. Why there are so-called COVID long haulers, the people who live with symptoms months after being infected. Why some people fare far better with COVID than others. Learning more about the immune system will be key. We expect that infectious diseases in the next 30 years would become the most prevalent uh, form of human ailment. Another change these researchers hope to work on may not be the result of any clinical trial. They'd like to see clearer, straightforward communication about science, making it more approachable, especially when it comes to vaccines. Many scientists have been talking to the public and explaining how it works. And I think that was missing. As scientists, we, we don't always uh, communicate our science well to the public. And I think that has to change, and I think this has been a part of that process of it changing. The side effect that I've seen is that there are many people that are speaking authoritatively that, that don't understand the, the concept, and that, that can be a, a little dangerous. I think what that translates into it, adults in the public is not a fear, but a hesitancy. And that leads us to this idea that there's this mystery behind what's happening. There's this black box of what occurs, and uh, scientists is, science is for the super elite or the super smart or the whatever, and, and none of that is true. Science is about discovery and exploration um, and asking questions. Perhaps the biggest question in front of all of us now is when will this pandemic end? Things seem to be returning to normal in 2021, then the Delta variant arrived. The more COVID spreads, the more it mutates. If we can stop the virus, being in us uh, and not transmitting it to others, we can stop the variants. It's really that simple. So to have less virus in the population, we need people to be vaccinated uh, or to be wearing masks or to be distancing themselves and not transmitting and getting sick. So every time a virus can divide, uh, there's a chance we'll have a new variant. 99% of the time, that new variant is not any worse than the one we see. Maybe 1% we're going to see one that is. A solution relying on science and human behavior. Texas Biomed is relying on the ways it's had to adapt because of COVID-19 and the lessons learned here to shape the role it will play during the next outbreak. If there was to be another pandemic soon, I think the response would be better. Um, System-wide, nationwide, and, and I think worldwide. I think the future uh, will be a very different type of vision from my perspective where organizations like Texas Biomed can participate in a much more proactive, sustainable way to help avert these pandemics, which will occur again uh, in the future. Just as we've done for the past 19 months, we'll continue to bring you the latest news about the pandemic and any scientific breakthroughs meant to address it. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. We'll see you next time.